Angina is a very common cardiac condition, okay? It is actually, the word angina refers to a fancy term for a collection of symptoms which then tell us that the heart needs investigating. The doctor can't say you have angina if you don't say you have something. You have to have some symptoms as a patient, uh, be that chest discomfort or breathlessness on exertion. You then go to the doctor, the doctor puts it together and says, ah, that sounds like angina. If you have no symptoms, you don't have angina. If you have symptoms, then those symptoms uh, can be put together, you know, the description plus the doctor's own intuition, and he can then give it the name angina. Angina was first described in 1772, described by a guy called William Heberden, and he wrote a beautiful piece in this journal where he wrote about um, some account of a disorder of the breast. That was the original kind of paper where he described this condition. And I'd love to read that out to you. This is a very nice and accurate description of angina and still holds to this day. So this is from William Heberden's paper in 1772 entitled Some Account of a Disorder of the Breast. But there is a disorder of the breast marked with strong and peculiar symptoms, considerable for the kind of danger belonging to it, and not extremely rare, which deserves to be mentioned more at length. The seat of it and the sense of strangling and anxiety with which it is attended may make it not improperly be called angina pectoris. Those who are affected with it are seized while they're walking, more especially if it be uphill and soon after eating, with a painful and most disagreeable sensation in the breast, which seems as it would extinguish life if it were to increase or to continue. But the moment they stand still, all this uneasiness vanishes. In all other respects, the patients are, at the beginning of this disorder, perfectly well, and in particular have no shortness of breath from which it is totally different. The pain is sometimes situated in the upper part, sometimes in the middle, sometimes in the bottom of the os terni, and more often inclined to the left rather than the right side, it, is likewise very free, it likewise very frequently extends from the breast to the middle of the left arm. The pulse is at least sometimes not disturbed by this pain, as I have had the opportunity of observing by feeling the pulse during the paroxysm. Males are more liable to this disorder, especially such as have passed their 50th year. After it has continued a year or more, it will not cease so instantaneously upon standing still, and it will come on not only when the persons are walking, but when they're lying down, especially if they lie on their left side and oblige them to rise out of their beds. In some inveterate cases, it has been brought on by the motion of a horse or a carriage, and even by swallowing, coughing, going to stool, or speaking, or any disturbance of the mind. Such is the most unusual appearance of this disease, but some varieties may be met with. Some have been seized while they were standing still or sitting, also upon first waking out of sleep, and the pain sometimes reaches to the right arm, as well as to the left and even down the hands, but this is uncommon. In a few instances, the arm has at the same time been numbed and swelled. In one or two persons, the pain has lasted some hours or even days. But this happened when the complaint has been of long standing and thoroughly rooted in the constitution. Once only the very first attack continued the whole night. Heberden writes, I have seen nearly a hundred people under this disorder, of which number there have been three women, one boy 12 years old, all the rest were men, all past their 50th year of life. The termination of the angina pectoris is remarkable. For if no accident interferes, but the disease goes to its height, the patients all suddenly fall down and perish almost immediately, of which indeed their frequent faintness and sensations as if all the powers of life were failing afford no obscure intimation. So this is a wonderful description of angina pectoris, which he talks about the fact that the discomfort is brought on by physical exertion, gets better with rest, it tends to affect men more than women. It tends to generally affect older men, men above the age of 50, but it can occur in younger people as well. 
The fact is that if you don't do anything about it and if you let it continue, it gets worse over a period of time and eventually it can be dangerous to the point where it can be life-threatening. So this was a wonderful description of uh, angina pectoris and still holds true. So the way I work out whether someone has angina is I would ordinarily get a patient come to me, they will say, look, you know, I've been noticing that I'm getting a bit more breathless, I'm getting some chest tightness. I'll say, do you, you know, do you get any, uh, any heaviness or anything? And they'll often say, it's not a pain, it's a heaviness, it's like a constriction, which is exactly what angina is. Very often I get people saying, you know, it's like someone sitting on my chest, it's very uncomfortable. And they'll probably notice it first thing in the morning when they're out walking their dog, they walk a certain distance, maybe going uphill, maybe when there's a cold wind blowing, and they'll notice this tightness. Sometimes it goes down the arms, but not always. Then they have to slow down. And as they slow down, the discomfort goes away. So when someone describes that to me, I'm thinking, okay, this is angina. This is what I would call angina. So why does angina happen? Well, the fundamental problem in angina is a lack of oxygen-rich blood getting to the heart. The heart is a muscle, it needs oxygen, it needs blood to provide it with that oxygen. And if you deprive the muscle of oxygen or the blood that's taking the oxygen there, then the heart will start suffocating and that suffocation is manifested as a discomfort. So that is the fundamental issue behind angina. Why does it happen? Well, uh, firstly, age. So as a person gets older, you get wear and tear in the heart arteries, the arteries that take the blood to the heart muscle. And as those get narrowed, the blood doesn't get through as quickly. And that can be one reason. Number two, genetics. So bad genetics can contribute. So if you have uh, a big, long you know, family history of uh, people developing angina to young age in particular, under the age of 60, you get lots of family members, then there's no doubt that genetics can contribute. The third thing is just bad luck. So if you're just very unlucky, you can develop this condition. And by far and away, the one thing that we can do something about, which can also contribute, is lifestyle. So things like cigarette smoking, obesity, if you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, if you don't sleep adequately, sleep apnea, and stress. Uh, all these things can contribute to the development of narrowings in the heart arteries that can then manifest as having angina. I'll show you exactly what the problem is on a, on, on a little drawing, then that will help us understand why uh, we treat it in the way we do. The way I like to describe angina is, think of a car. Think of a car here, and the car engine needs fuel. And so angina is usually caused by crud developing in this pipe that takes the fuel to the engine. So in essence, if you can imagine that actually when the car is not doing very much, the fuel probably trickle through and you won't notice a problem. However, if the car is trying to go very fast, let's say the car's going up an incline where it needs a lot of, uh, uh, it needs a lot of um, power, needs a lot of fuel to try and push it up the incline, or the car is going very fast, then the fuel will struggle to get through and the car will, the engine will start suffocating and the driver will notice it. So that is the basic fundamental um, problem that's going on. I'll tell you how we treat it. Okay, the first thing, how do you diagnose it? So yes, the description is, uh, is what raises our awareness as doctors. We think, okay, you know, this is the guy describing angina. How do you then go about diagnosing it? Well, the first thing to say is you do an ECG. Why do we do an ECG? Because an ECG is something we can do quite easily. It doesn't necessarily give us the diagnosis, however. What it does tell us is whether, you know, if you have a normal heart, then it's very unusual to have an abnormal ECG. And it's always nice to know that the person has a normal heart to start off with. But the, the way you diagnose is twofold. One, you take the car out for a test drive. So if you take the engine out and really drive it hard, 
uh, then you see whether the engine is getting the fuel it needs. And that way we do exercise tests, which means we put people on a treadmill, make their heart go really, really fast so that it's asking for lots of blood. And if there is a narrowing in their heart arteries, then you expect that person either to start getting their symptoms or you start seeing changes on their ECG when they're exercising hard. So an exercise test can be very useful. In general, we would say that if an exercise test is completely normal, that's a very reassuring result, especially if someone can manage more than nine minutes on the treadmill walking at a good pace. These days, we have other tests whereby you can actually directly look into this fuel pipe. So you can actually look into it. The test there is something called a CT coronary angiogram, a CAT scan, which is done uh, on the heart and they give some dye and the dye goes into the heart and fills these tubes up and if you take a picture of the heart at that time you can see how the tube has been filled with this dye so if you had a narrowing you would see a pinched out bit you don't see that smooth contour of the contrast going into the blood vessel and because you see this pinched bit you can then conclude that there's a narrowing there the gold standard test is something called a coronary angiogram which is an invasive test and i'll try and explain how we do that well, we know that the problem with um, angina is these heart arteries here, okay? Now, every artery is eventually connected to the heart. So if you can find an artery in your wrist, for example, or in the groin, then that eventually leads to the heart. So what you can do is you can give a little bit of anesthetic here, puncture this artery, pass a wire up all the way, and this artery will eventually lead to the heart, so you can take the wire, push it all the way to the heart and over the wire you can slide a tube and then take the wire out. Once you've got that, you can inject some dye into the tube and then take x-rays and that shows the pictures up really nicely. And that's how angina is, cause of angina is diagnosed, i.e. the fact that the angina has been caused by these heart artery narrowings, that's how it's diagnosed. D different components of angina, the stable angina. Stable angina is where you get, uh, you walk a certain distance, you get chest discomfort, you stop, everything gets better. Next day you walk the same distance, you get the discomfort, you stop. That's stable because it's predictable and you can do something about it. It's consistent. Then there, is, and stable angina is generally, I mean, I think it definitely needs investigating. I definitely think it needs treatment. And I definitely, if anyone's getting angina, I would certainly recommend that they get checked out. But generally we don't consider it a high risk condition because it's consistent, it's stable, it's predictable, you can do something to take the discomfort away. Unstable angina is slightly different. Unstable angina is indeed dangerous. In unstable angina what happens is that you get progressive worsening of your symptoms. So either you find that normally you can walk uh, a mile without any discomfort, next day you can only walk half a mile, third day you can only walk 100 yards. That is unstable. Uh, because it's telling you that something is getting worse and worse very quickly and it can go very quickly it can go one day you can walk a mile next day you can only walk 100 yards that is an emergency and if anyone's getting that I personally think they should just come into hospital because it's telling us that the narrowing is so intense that the heart is not getting the blood remember if the suffocation goes away after resting you mean you know that the heart is getting the blood you know you the discomfort goes away after resting you know that the heart is now getting the blood but when it's getting to that stage you start realizing that actually maybe there's something really critical sitting there stopping the blood from from getting through the other thing that tells you about inst instability of angina is if the discomfort takes much longer to wear off so you know you do something the discomfort would usually wear off after a minute now it's taking five minutes your exercise capacity is getting less another thing that tells me about the instability of angina is if you start getting it at rest you know angina was off it's a description of something happening on exercise if the car is not even starting or if the car is just barely getting started and not beginning to stutter that tells you that there's a really tight narrowing here uh, so that is unstable angina and again unstable angina as i say serious medical emergency the problem is if you leave it and something blocks off then that part of the heart muscle is not going to get the blood and will start dying and you will never get that heart muscle back. So you never want to get to that eventuality where you're getting pain at rest over a prolonged period of time because with every minute that goes by, you're damaging irreversibly more of the heart muscle. 
So yes, yeah, stable angina, relatively low risk, unstable angina, very high risk, likely to culminate in a heart attack. Let me show you how we treat it. Um, so this is what we do. When the, the, the fundamental problem is this, right? Um, in angina, you've got something here which is stopping fuel from getting through. So there's a variety of things you can do to treat it. The first thing we often do is we give people a spray called a nitrolingual spray. And what nitrolingual spray does is when you uh, squirt it under your tongue, uh, it transiently opens up everything. So it transiently makes the whole pipe bigger. It doesn't take away this crud, but the gap between the crud gets bigger and therefore blood can get through and that's why it helps relieve discomfort very quickly. And I would always recommend that if someone is getting a lot of angina, not doing anything, they should take this because sometimes you just need that blood to get through. So that's the first thing we give our patients. We give nitrolingual spray. One of the problems with nitrolingual spray is that it opens up all the blood vessels. So it actually opens up blood vessels in the brain as well. And that's why people get a terrible headache when they take this spray. And that actually dissuades them from taking it but I really think that if you're getting bad chest discomfort, it's a good idea to take the spray. Sometimes taking the spray can make you feel dizzy and therefore it's a good idea to stop what you're doing, maybe sit down or lie down, take the spray and relax. And that should take the discomfort away. If you find that the discomfort is not going away with the spray, then it's always a good idea to call an ambulance because that's again pointing towards more unstable symptoms and come to a hospital. The second thing we do is we give aspirin. Now, the reason we give aspirin is this, that actually the problem is that the blood, when it's trying to get through here, is going to be more stagnant, trying to negotiate through this narrowing. And the problem with that is that we have platelets, which, um, you know, when blood starts stagnating through a narrowing, you have these platelets which can then congeal and cause the narrowing to become worse. So by giving them aspirin, which is an antiplatelet agent, which stops our platelets from sticking together, you minimize the risk of A, things getting worse, and actually allows the blood to get through the narrowing with a little bit easier. The third thing we do is we often give something called a beta blocker. Okay, these are medications that end with all, atenolol, bisoprolol, etc. What do beta blockers do? Well, one of the fundamental problems is a, a mismatch between supply and demand. Beta blockers slow the heart down. If the car is never going to go very fast, then the blood can get through more easily than if the car goes faster. And that's what the beta blockers do. So they slow the heart down and by doing so, uh, they reduce angina. It's worth also knowing that beta blockers work against adrenaline, so they blunt the effects of adrenaline. So they'll just slow you down as well a little bit, but they can be very useful uh, with regards to this. Some people who can't take beta blockers, you can give them calcium antagonists, which are again similar in that they can slow the heart down. Calcium antagonists can also open up our blood vessels, again increase the amount of blood getting through. None of these are actually taking away the condition. None of them are taking the disease away. They're just uh, masking the symptoms. You can also get this spray in a tablet form called isosorbide mononitrate. So it's, uh, it again works for a much longer period of time. The spray will only work for a few minutes and then the blood vessels will close up. Whereas these tablets work and can go on for up to 16 to 24 hours. And that's uh, another thing we use. Finally, we often give our patients statins. Uh, and I know that a lot of people are very worried, very dubious about statins, but there's no doubt that a lot of this narrowing that has built up is because of inflammation. And then because of inflammation, you get hardening of the arteries and lots of things get stuck in these areas causing the narrowing. But one of the things that has been implicated is also cholesterol. I don't think cholesterol is the problem, but I think cholesterol then contributes. And so in that setting, if you do have angina, taking something that takes minimizes the amount of cholesterol in your bloodstream is considered a good idea because it'll hopefully stabilize things and stop them from getting worse. Finally, there are other things you can do. You could potentially open the narrowing up. How do you open the narrowing up? Well, you can actually, when you do the angiogram, you can put a little stent in, a metal stent. So you can put this thing, which is coiled stent into this narrowing and then blow it up and then it gets bigger and so opens this narrowing up. And usually stents are uh, very commonly placed 
and help relieve the symptoms of angina. Another thing you can do is that you can actually bypass this area by doing a heart bypass. Instead of the blood going down here, the blood chooses then to go down there and bypasses it. Who is better for stents? Well, if you have only one narrowing, then a stent is a good idea. If you have two narrowings, maybe a stent is a good idea. But if you've got 10 narrowings, then it makes far more sense to bypass all those narrowings with one operation rather than having to be considered for 10 different stents because each stent has its own risks, whereas a bypass operation is just one operation and you get everything fixed together. I think in terms of if you have angina, the first thing to understand is that, you know, it's a common uh, condition. It shouldn't, you should never let something like that enslave you. You should never let something like that stop you from living your life. When it does, that is the time for your doctor to do something about it, to relieve those symptoms so that you can get back to living your life. I think the only thing we can do is improve our lifestyles. I definitely think if you smoke or if people around you smoke, then it's a good thing to try and avoid that. I think recreational drugs like cocaine can make this kind of thing worse, so you should try and avoid that. I think exercise is exceptionally good. Whilst we may think that you know exercise is bad because it makes things worse, of course it does, you, but that doesn't mean we should become sedentary. What we should do is not exercise to the point where we're starting to get discomfort, but we should do some exercise. And actually what we find is that one of the th really good things about exercise is that it promotes new blood vessels to develop tiny blood vessels. And in some ways exercise can help form little natural bypasses where people form these collateral vessels which get the blood where it needs to go without having to go through the narrowed bit. So in that sense exercise is an exceptionally good thing. Of course you should always talk to your doctor and make sure that he's happy for you to do that and I don't think it's a good idea to exercise if you're having ongoing pain but if you're not getting pain, if your tablets are controlling your symptoms then doing some exercise is a good thing. Getting good sleep is really really important uh, and finally minimizing the impact of stress in our lives is hugely important because stress can uh, really make everything worse. So I hope you found this useful, I would love to hear your comments and thank you so much for all that you do for me.